Okay, at this time of year, gathering the fuel at our fire or our Kelly kettle is going to need. Um, it's been very wet here. Stuff lying on the ground has soaked up a lot of that moisture over the last few weeks, months. It's actually no good to us. It looks very enticing because they're lovely twigs all right where we want them, but they're no good. They'll have soaked up water. We won't be able to burn them. What we're looking for is likely to be hanging up in the branches, stuff that's been dislodged by the wind, stuff that's attached to a dead tree. We're looking for a nice, audible, dry snap to it. When we set the group to work to gather wood, that's definitely going to be their job on branching out. We don't want them going to the trees here and gleefully snapping off twigs that are you know, off perfectly live trees. This one with buds on the ends. It's important to run through this with them first. Here's something that's obviously blown off from higher up, hanging in the trees, very dry, very dead. So we've graded the wood that we're going to use for the fire. So these are the smallest pieces of wood. These are about matchstick thickness. And everything is very dry. So we've chopped these up earlier. So these are about thumb thickness and then go up in size to these ones which are also slightly longer so that would increase the size of your fire so that's probably the largest we would need to use today when you are choosing your fire site and you're, you've cleared the ground it's also before you clear the ground it's important that you look up above you and have a look at where the crowns of the trees are and make sure that there's no overhanging branches over your fire site because dead leaves and dead branches can easily catch light. So for the next part it's quite important that you have a safety barrier for your fire so that nobody steps over that and accidentally steps into the fire. So you just need four sticks which I found earlier just doesn't matter if they're wet they just mark the edge of the fire which is going to be around the edge of our fire pit. Like so. So uh, Natalie, what are these sticks for? Okay, so I'm just pu putting some wood down onto the bare ground to keep the fire off the ground. Next I'm going to put my sticks on my little platform. Now these are really dry and I'm going to use some petroleum jelly, some Vaseline. And as this is a byproduct of the oil industry, it's quite flammable, so it's quite good to use with some very dry cotton wool. So I'm just coating the, va the cotton wool in Vaseline. I'm going to put a few of those on my dry twigs. So to make the spark, we're going to use a flint and steel, or this one is a ferro rod, um, which makes a spark. I'll just demonstrate in the air. And if you're not used to using these, it's always good to maybe make a few sparks in the air first, just so that you get the feel for it and you know what you're doing. And this should mean the cotton wool can light very easily. And it's important that you have your dry twigs very close at hand. So as soon as you get a flame, you can put your dry twigs onto them. On a wet day like this, I like to keep them in my pocket. So you start with the smallest wood first and then you build it up in size. So what we've done now is placed our slightly larger pieces of wood onto the flame as quickly as possible. So if you need to get some air into the fire the best thing to do is like Tom just demonstrated is using the fire blanket. We'll use something that you can flap air into the fire with. Built the fire in a crisscross pattern. That's going to allow the flames access to the wood the whole time. We've built it in a teepee and more sort of traditional iconic look. There's danger that the middle will burn out and we'll just be left with a sort of teepee of blackened sticks. Now that we've got it like this, I'm able to place on some of the wood that we cracked up earlier, and at the dry inside of it. A little bit of a balancing act here. But we want the flames to find the dry stuff that we exposed inside the wood. Oh, 
Okay, well it's time to leave the, the site now. Um, probably the most important thing we're going to do today is make sure that our fire is fully extinguished and as far as possible we've returned the fire site to the way we found it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use our remaining water and it's always worthwhile conserving some for this job uh, and standing at a safe distance downwind of the fire I'm going to add it not all in a one but gently round the edges first I don't want to douse the whole thing and find there's still a burning patch and I'm out of water. So here we go, the white stuff is the hottest and nail those. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to spread the, uh, the burn logs a bit, allow them to cool further and I'm going to use this stick to puncture the ground in several places to allow the water to penetrate better. With that done, I'm going to add what may end up being the last of my water, but I'm reasonably certain now that the fire is extinguished fully. There's a final test you can do to make sure that you yourself are certain that the fire is extinguished, and it's this. And if you're not ready to do it, then you can be reasonably sure that your fire isn't fully out. And once we've safely disposed of all the, uh, the charred pieces of wood, we're going to replace uh, any turf or top material that we remove from the fire pit in the first place. This way, as closely as possible, we're returning the site to the way we found it. We want the next people here to feel like they were the first people. That's uh, definitely at the heart of the, the John Muir way of doing things.